Oh, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. This is episode number 157, coming at you live and direct from Stratford East London. How you doing? How you feeling? Oh, hope you guys are well. I'm fucking awesome. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling really refreshed. I've been doing loads of push-ups these, these past couple of days, I'm doing about 100 a day, which feels quite good. Um, It's weird how much, how, uh, blah, 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 how a few push-ups can really help define your chest. It's something I should probably know. Um, I should have probably known a long time ago. But um, I've seen a lot of more form come into my chest area, and my arms are getting stronger as well. Um, and in general, my uh, muscular endurance, being able to bang out ten push-ups, is a lot easier too. Doing it's 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 just again, you do, you need these little examples in life to kind of like teach you things you already know. But it's just interesting how um, it's interesting how. Not interesting, but it's also well, not interesting. Well, interesting, it's interesting. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Um, how when you do something repetitively over a long period of time, it just becomes easier to do, right? So when I first started doing push-ups, I had to if I was doing a set of ten, I'd have to break them up into fives. Now I can bang out a whole set of ten, and sometimes I can do twenty, um, all in one go without stopping, which is amazing, right? With great form, like point making sure my arm, my elbows are tucked in and pushing up. You know, like doing them to the CrossFit standards. Um, and again, this is just from doing them every single day. And honestly, I used to struggle a lot to do push-ups. Like there's, I, I had that weird strength where I could do, I could bench a lot, but I couldn't actually do push-ups. And the only reason why I couldn't do push-ups is because guess why? Because I weren't doing push-ups regularly. So the moment you start doing something more frequently, the easier it becomes. But again, at the beginning, it's very difficult because you know you're panting, you're breathing heavily, um, you feel like you're about to drop dead, and um, everything hurts. It's not really the best kind of solution to be. And let me actually move this camera a bit forward here. You don't, you, you, you just don't feel good about how you're doing it. But then over time, you know, you get better and better and better. And you start to slowly um, build up some sort of muscular endurance and strength when it comes to um, doing push-ups and stuff. So I'm feeling really good about it at the moment. I'm going to continue doing it on top of the running that I'm doing at the moment. Um, I haven't run for the last couple of days, but I'm going to go running this evening um, when I come back from work and stuff. So that should be good. Um, and then kind of carry on until Sunday and get that going all the way forward. Um, apart from that, what else has been going on? Um, finally, the interview stages of all the stuff I've been interviewing for has kind of finally wrapped up. I'm going to be starting a new role on Monday, so that should be quite interesting to kind of get back on that wagon again. Um, it's been cool. Um, these last couple of months have been an interesting um, experience to kind of go through, you know, um, trying to apply for things after Christmas, during the new year is um not the most advantageous time i'm not really a believer in like oh it's never a good time never a good time but sometimes um you know there are things outside of your control that can um, add to the issue of it not being a good time and maybe looking for something looking for a new role during christmas during the new year isn't probably the most advantageous time especially because most offices like like you know most people working they usually close quite early in december or they start winding down you know december is usually the one time in the year where generally everyone takes a holiday everyone has a break so even summer sometimes even because you know i've mentioned it a few times you know with the prevalence of fucking festivals taking over the world and um people and the cost of um you know travel especially mainland europe is is drastically cheaper than what it was in the past and some international flights too are quite cheap if you book them ahead of time it seems like everyone's going on holiday right it seems like everyone's kind of going abroad but even in the summer there's a lot of people that stay behind and don't really go anywhere but christmas is the one time where people tend to like take time off work and really kind of you know take the break the allotted break that's given to them and um this year has been no different i felt like anyway i felt as if like let me move the camera a little bit down should i move it here a little bit yeah there that looks good no i should move it up a little bit here and this year, I felt no different, actually, um, to with it, because it seemed like everything I was applying for, people were only getting back to me, what, in, I think, in the mi middle of January or something. I saw I saw quite a lot of responses, um, and that was with stuff I've been sending out applications from, like, November or something. So it just goes to show that maybe this, this time of the year, from, like, let's say, October to maybe February, is maybe the slowest month in terms of kind of turning that around. But uh, thankfully... Um, through some effort on my end and just through some good timing and you know uh locking out and kind of you know applying for things that i'm kind of interested in i've been able to finally get a role and i'm starting on monday so that should be interesting to do um and see where that goes from there i'm not really looking forward to the whole first week of like getting to know people and you know um the whole uh, all the introductions having to repeat the, your same little story about yourself the four or five times should be cool um 
it's always a bit I, I don't know I've always even I enjoy being a center of attention I find I find those kind of things a bit cringy you know like oh so oh wow where's your name from da, 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 da. it's like the same sort of like questions that you're used to used to kind of hearing which is no no um it's no fault of the person of course because you know um you are generally a new person to them they did, generally didn't know you existed before that um but Let's see. Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens when I start. I'm not. I'm gonna keep my. I'm gonna keep keep my mind open, and see how it all is when I start on Monday. But yeah, I got a new position starting on Monday, and um, everything should be fine from then on. Um, apart from that, taking a bit of a break this week, DJing wise. Not DJing this weekend. I'm gonna be staying in at home, trying to kind of focus and get my mind right for the Monday. Just want to kind of like ease into it and not kind of be surprised by anything. That should be interesting. Um, so doing that and yeah, just chilling out, man. Um, yesterday was an interesting one, isn't it? Yesterday, United lost two 0 to PSG, which was um a result I don't think a lot of fans expected to, to to see so quickly or to see um actually to that level. I think um as per usual as football fans, we always kind of are eternal optimists, right? Whenever we see any kind of light in the tunnel, we always kind of hope that that's kind of the the turning point. I think Ole Gunnar Solskjaer has done a really good job with United so far. He's come in and really, in 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 theory, kind of restored the feeling back in the club, right? Um, he allowed us to kind of dream again. Um, he allowed us to kind of be hopeful again. Uh, put smiles back on faces. Got us playing more attacking football. Got us trying to win possession high up the pitch. Loads of interesting things that he's basically done, right? And it kind of worked so far, so good. But then the moment we kind of faced up, we came up to like real quality. The moment our quality on the other end of the pitch kind of got injured, you know, back-to-back injuries to Jesse Lingard and Anthony Martial. And then effectively the tie was over. As soon as they scored, we didn't really have any threats going forward. Um, Mata came on and, you know, he doesn't just doesn't have the pace to kind of really hurt teams and isn't probably ingenious enough in the middle of the park to really do anything either. Sanchez just looks, I don't know, man. Is there Has there been a worse signing, um, a worse kind of high-profile signing than Alexis Sanchez? Especially considering how devastatingly good he was at Arsenal. Um, he just de- hasn't really turned up since he joined United. And all in all, I think we've seen effectively that we're quite a top-heavy team, right? I think by and large, top-heavy. Um, our attack is where we're really potent, right? A front three of Lingard, Mash- L- Lingard M- Rashford and Martial can score goals against any side, right? Um, but the midfield still kind of requires some attention. I'm not really sure if Ander Herrera and Matic are the best accompaniments to a Paul Pogba midfield. You could probably do it an upgrade in both of them. But where we really let ourselves down is definitely in defence. I think the back three of like Lindelof, Behi and Young, you just need more from them in terms of bringing the ball out, up, out, up, out of defence and into the midfield. You need to see more on the ball. Um, you need more in their positional sense. You just need more from them. And unfortunately, they just don't have it. It's not their fault. You know, they they can only do what they can do within their kind of talent range or within their ability range. But that's where a lot of investment needs to be put in. Um, and I would be, um, it would be, um, um, it would be really negligent if we went into the new season next year and didn't address that. Um, I was a bit annoyed with, you know, Phil Jones and that lot getting contract extensions. Ashley Young, not so much because, you know, he's done a good job and he's a model pro. But Phil Jones kind of getting 100 was a bit annoying because, you know, he's definitely showed us that even without, even without the injuries, he's just not to a level that we need. He probably is a good backup centre-back, I would say. Um, but maybe not a good starting centre, not maybe not, definitely not a starting centre-back for uh, United, especially if we have ambitions to win the league again, win the Champions League. You just can't have a defender at that level. You need, you need something more. So, but again, you know, the transfer market is just so overpriced these days, so overblown. So I'm not sure how, who we're going to get, if we're going to get them for cheap. Um, there's a lot of international players out there that we're kind of looking at. There was a Manola Sat Roma. There's a kid, uh, Delight, Delete, or that 17 year old kid at um, Ajax that people are looking at that looks pretty good. So there's a few options out there. Uh, obviously, Kulabali, a lot of people have been talking about, but he's just signed a new contract extension, so I'm sure it won't be cheap to get him out of that contract. A lot of people out there that we should probably be going for, and hopefully we do. Um, but by and large, a re- bit of a reality check. I don't think this is a, a thing that should kind of, you know, hamper Solskjaer's chance of getting a job. I still think it's a big job anyway. I think the midfield has always been a weak spot for United. I think over the years, we have failed to kind of really address that, even during Sir Ferguson's period. I think I think Fellaini might have been the first new midfielder we bought in, like maybe since Sir Ferguson retired, you know? Like an actual new, like when he came in, he was like the new midfielder. We'd never ever built midfielders before. We kind of always kind of made do with the people that we had or put square pegs and run holes. But now we definitely need to step that up a little bit. Um, 
which is not going to be cheap. But by and large, um, PSG were kind of worthy winners. Um, the goading of Di Maria didn't seem to work. He's, he definitely turned up more so than he did any time. He was at United, which was quite annoying to see. But, you know, fair play to the lad. He, he took a lot of stick at, at, at Old Trafford, got got a beer bottle thrown at him, got pushed into the stands by Ashley Young and still managed to kind of uh, turn in a man match performance. So he did really well in that game too, which was annoying. But, hey, what can you do? Um, by and large, a disappointing game for us. And hopefully we um, we can, you know, we... We show a better, we show a better selves in the return leg. It could get embarrassing in the return leg. We could go out there and try to attack, and they could just pick us off on the counter attack because we saw how scary um, Mbappe's pace was. But I'm hoping that we can kind of, you know, um, give ourselves something to shout about when we go to Paris. There's basically no um, risk on our end anyway because kind of the game is over on paper. So it, we it, we should be going out there trying to do something. But it's a bit concerning with Martial and Rash and um, Lingard out on injuries because our options after that aren't that great. We might have to change the way we play. We might have to play five in midfield and have one up front in terms of that way. If we're going to play four three, if we're going to play with um, without those players, um, it might mean, might mean we might have to promote some of the youngsters coming up um, into the first team. But it's going to be a tricky, tricky end of the season. It seems like if those players are out for a sustained period of time. But hey, ho, that happens. What's what happens when you start playing at the top level, isn't it? I guess. Um. Anyway, away from football, got some stuff to talk about. Updates, updates, updates. Number one update is on the whole Gucci blackface um uh, debacle that kind of rolled out over the last few days. I obviously I made some comments about it on Monday, and I think um having kind of thought about it a bit more and really meditated on what's kind of going on. Um, and just kind of thought about it a bit more. I don't, I just don't, I don't know how, um, constructive, I don't know how, um, worthwhile, constructive, um, responsible it is to counsel Gucci for the blackface, you know, debacle that's gone on. I sometimes think like not all actions should, you don't, you shouldn't be judged for all your actions. You may be judged for the body of work that you've kind of produced thus far. I think Gucci, since they've hired Alessandro Michele, um, they've kind of gone from strength to strength. Of course, he's kind of restored the house and kind of brought it back to the levels of influence that it might have had when um, they were under the helm of Tom Ford. And he's really kind of restored this great feeling um, around Gucci, a feeling of nostalgia, a feeling of opulence, a feeling of accessibility. Um, and for that, you know, he's obviously kind of leaned in mostly with the kind of hip hop crew or hip hop crowd or hip hop culture or black culture. And we've kind of taken them in and we've kind of kind of, you know, really um, embraced them for everything they kind of represent. And of course, along the way, they kind of had a couple of missteps, you know, the whole Dapper Dan situation. But they quickly rectified that. They gave him his own atelier. Um, he kind of worked basically in-house with Gucci, but has his own atelier in Harlem that he kind of runs, uh, similar to the, the stuff that he was doing in the 80s. Um, so essentially, they've kind of corrected those wrongs. They've kind of, you know, they are very much for gifting and dressing various hip-hop acts that we know and love um, i'm sure um behind the scenes they probably allow give people discounts and stuff so they do a lot of great work right stuff that they don't need to do because we see many luxury brands who've kind of gone out of their way to kind of um distance themselves to be associated with hip-hop right they don't want any active association don't want any active collaboration but gucci have really embraced hip-hop community for the most part so i think their actions are quite genuine right i think they are really about the culture and I think the blackface jumper is, if anything, just a misstep on their part because they don't probably have anyone in their offices who is of, um, who comes from the culture, who understands what it means, the significance of it, right? I don't think they necessarily get it. Um, again, I don't think um, there's some comments out there saying, no, black people are too sensitive. Um, we complain about everything and everything. I don't necessarily agree with that. I think sometimes you need to call things out for exactly what they are. But I also think sometimes, too, things can just happen that don't necessarily have the intentions that you may think they have intentions of. Right? That jumper could just have been a jumper they thought looked cool. It could have just been an extension of the Banaclava ski mask thing that they do, right? It could just be that. We just we don't, we actually don't know what the intentions are. But I think in nowadays, you know, with the whole, with how we are on social media, there is a tendency to maybe cancel people or cancel brands. But I think Gucci, in this case, probably shouldn't be canceled because by and large, they have been a big supporter of the hip-hop industry. And I also think they addressed it in a really good way. They responded quite quickly. They apologized. They took down the the item. Um, one of their chairmen made a long, lengthy statement, kind of, you know, really um, apologize for what happened. And now um, Alessandro, Alessandro Michele himself made a statement now, released a statement um, to his staff that I'm going to read out loud that kind of um, echoes the same sort of thoughts. Um, 
and it says the following duh, 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 duh. dear colleagues i have i have, i feel the need to write to you all um these few words to give you a name to give a name to the pain of these days um um my own and that of the people who saw in one of my creative projects an intolerable insult it's important to me to let you know that the jumper actually had a very specific reference, completely different from what was described instead, which is uh, which we can understand. It was a tribute to Lee Barry, um, to his camouflage art, to his ability to challenge bourgeoisie conventions and to conformism, to his eccentric as a performer and to his extraordinary vo vocation as a masquerader meant as a hymn to freedom. Oh, this makes sense. And the little Barry, the kind of, you know, how he kind of did that really messy lipstick stuff where he went kind of over the edges. This is before Kylie and Kendall, by the way. Um, maybe, do you think they took a version of Lee Barry? I doubt it. But anyway, um, the fact that contrarily to my intentions at Turtleneck, Jumper evoked a racist imagery causes me the greatest grief. But I'm aware that sometimes our actions can end up with the causing unintentional effects. It is therefore necessary to take in full accountability for these, eff for, for these effects, which is, you know, admirable in that regard. For this reason, our company immediately apologized and withdrew the garment that produced us controversies. As you may have read from Marco in his letter, we are putting in place a series of immediate actions across the world that will increase exclusivity, diversity, participation, and cultural awareness at any level and in any workplace. We are truly committed to facing what happened as a crucial learning moment for everybody. It is always for... Now, the inclusivity thing, I'm not that, you know... I don't know. It's a, it, it can get it, it can come across a bit heavy handed. I don't really know what they're gonna what are they gonna do? Are they gonna start hiring black people in their stores and stuff actively only to kind of you know increase inclusivity and diversity? I'm not really sure that's the right thing because it's not it's not just a black issue. It's an issue of um, cultural awareness. So not all black people are that culturally aware, or not all black people are are that bothered or that are that offended when they see stuff like that, right? Um, so it's about including the right type of voices in the conversation, but more so more so than that. It's about that cultural, it's about understanding what's happening now because I think what we're seeing now in the last come few years or last decade or so with the prevalence of hip hop kind of growing and growing, we're seeing this influence that these various different art forms or these cultures have within commerce, right? We're seeing how important, we're seeing the effects of it more viscerally now than we, we probably understood in previous times maybe because the internet maybe because of social media i don't know what it is but we're seeing how influential influencers artists djs wherever they may be special um, um uh socialized so these people are we're seeing what influence they actually have on commerce directly right we're seeing that if amber rose wears this top and she posts a, a, a unique link of it to fashion over and people click it they can see they can track how much uh traction Amber Rose takes to their website. They can track how quickly Amber Rose's top sells out on their website. We can see it now, black and white. Oh shit, this person's really culturally relevant, right? Mm -hmm. We need to tap into them. We need to kind of associate with them. We need to line up with them. So I think because of that, there's even more responsibility on our end as buyers and as consumers, right? Or people in the culture to be very cognitive and be very aware of who we are giving attention to and who we're spending our money with. So if they do anything that kind of like rubs us up the wrong way, the best way to protest, the best way to kind of make them understand what, or to make them take notice, is to stop buying what they're making, right? But I also think within that process, there needs to be understanding on the brands end of things. So understand that if you're directly marketing to a, set, a, a particular demographic, a particular kind of cultural base, a particular uh, a particular subsect of people, you need to have those people included, right, in the messaging, right, in the design in the iteration process whatever you're doing with the consultation you they, they need to be consulted some way or the other they have to be included in the conversation you can't just be throwing out shit to people and not having them involved in it. it just doesn't make sense and that's the only way that's the only i think fashion is the only place it always happens right where they kind of you know when, when skateboarding was the in thing they were pushing all these fucking cringeworthy skateboard editorials right that had no basis in skateboarding, right? That were completely toned it. That just had this hot model standing next to their skateboarder of choice, usually some dude from Palace, right? That was just fucking gob shit. It just didn't make any sense, right? But in the moment you start including people from that scene into the process of design, into the process of consultation, the process, the effects or the end product become a little bit more polished. They become a little bit more nuanced. They become a little bit more on point. That's what happens. So it only serves a brand um better to include people like us in the conversation people that give a shit about the music people that give a shit about the culture and the moment they don't is when we get these backface jumpers 
So for the inclusivity and diversity conversations that are included there, it's not just a quota thing. It's not just about, it's not just about, it's about reflecting your customer base. And if you're going to directly market to them, bring them into the conversation. Don't just have them on the outside. And that's what a lot has been happening in the fashion industry, right? A lot of like um, gatekeepers and people just trying to, you know, uh, make sure they they're, they stay inside of a job. A lot of nepotism, right? Hiring of the same people from the same scene from, the, from a, a particular family name. But I think it's slowly but surely changing. You see, even with the street style pictures, right? The people that are featured on the street style pictures, you know, they look like me and you, right? They're, they're from all over the fucking world, right? They're wearing brands. They're smashing brands together. They're, they're head to toe in different things you would never expect them to be in. And I think they need more. We need to see them more, including more in the converse, in the kind of design iteration process than just sitting on the runway or just standing outside of a show or walking down the street. That's all well and good. I'm happy that that's happening, but we need to see more active participation on that end. So I'm hoping what Gucci is doing isn't just going to be hiring more black and brown people in their stores, right? I'm hoping that it's going to be a more of an active role given, given black and brown people who are involved in making your brand a hot and more of an active role in what goes into making your brand in what goes into the campaigns, what goes into the editorials, what goes into the runway, what goes into what makes it onto a store, what makes it online, what, how you do your merchandising, get those voices involved and then you'll avoid these blackface conversations. That's all it takes really, because what you see when you see the blackface thing, it's not that it's offensive. It's that it tells you that there's no one in that company that understood that that could be offensive. That's the only issue. It's like, fucking hell, there was no one in that company, no one. Or no one would have loud enough voice because you see, for sure, we know Alessandro Michele isn't a racist. We know he doesn't have those bigoted views because he's very, he's been very open, very aware and very um, happy to kind of tap into that world, right? To have to be associated with the names that are in that world. He's kind of actively gone out of the way to do it. So we know that's not his intentions, but, you know, it means that in the whole company, there's no one really that looks like us that's there. And that's kind of, and that's a sad thing considering just how how important of a customer base or of an influence we are to their overall market or to their overall r- r- revenue stream but anyway the, the 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 statement continues um i've always thought to i've always thought to grant myself and any other the possibility to be different i've hardly been through i've i've hardly been through this fight all over my personal huh? i've hardly been through this i've hardly been through this fight all over my personal life and i later brought it into my work here i was always tried to give citizenships right to the traditional marginalized to those who felt unrepresented to those that the history silence and made by and made believe they were worthless my aim in which personal and political are intimately woven has always been to turn um, the pain into a chant therefore i've always worked to let alternative Im- imaginaries loaded with joyful inclusions emerge imagine imagery is able to celebrate diversity in every form imagery is able to empower I- images to favor empowerment and self-determination process this is who i am and these are the things i believe in i really shelter the suffer of i really shelter the suffer of all i have offended and i feel heartfelt sorry for this hurt I hope I can rely on the understanding of those who know me and can lodge a constant tension towards the celebration of diversity and that's always shaped my work. This is the only celebration I'm willing to stand for. That's a great apology and I'm I'm, I'm sure for for sure that Alessandro Michele is very sincere in what he's saying. I'm sure he's and I'm and I would I would say his actions really prove that, you know, he's about the culture. I just think this is a misstep. Um, for the most part, I don't think we should kind of cancel Gucci. But again, I just think it's a wake up call for the fashion industry in general. Just to address these obvious blind spots right where they don't include people in the conversation that they're addressing to that's the problem i think everyone had with vetema in the later years i think the first couple of collections when they were first burst onto the scene it was all well and good to see a completely white cast of models right and to be honest i didn't even notice right um because they were, they were representing a particular kind of aesthetic right it came from a particular place right um them that's from georgia um eastern block right there's that particular harsh um soviet influence seeping through the brand and you know by and large i would assume he probably didn't grow up with a lot of people from different places of the world or, or who didn't he didn't grow up with people that looked different than what he looked like right so i can imagine those first couple of questions really did echo where he was coming from but then as soon as veteran started picking up and then you saw people that looked like me wearing it right um or you saw asian people wearing it who are probably the biggest kind of um consumers of the brand by and large if you click um Vetimar, uh hashtags on instagram you're only going to see black and black and asian people like that's it right um wearing a brand it got a little bit tone deaf it got a little bit it didn't really make sense when he weren't including those faces in the catwalk right because a catwalk runway show from my 
from what I think of it, it's like a living lookbook, right? You are essentially trying to give, you're trying to, trying to provide a visual imagery, a kind of, you know, a moving picture of what these clothes may look like on the person that wants to buy them, right? And usually you want to see someone that looks like you're on the runway or somebody you want to emulate and look like you're on the runway. And the easy way to tap into that if you're a brand is to just kind of, you know, tap into the consumer base that kind of want to wear your product and put it out there so you can kind of build this kind of, oh my God, I need that thing. I need that thing in my wardrobe. So if Vetimo weren't doing it, that's why people kind of got a bit annoyed. I wasn't really annoyed by it just because I was annoyed because of the whole like, oh, let's just include black people for, for the sake of it or Asian people for the sake of it. No, I was just, inclu- I was just annoyed for the sake of you know, these are the people that are actually buying into your brand. Why not have them on the runway? It just didn't make any sense. Because obviously I'm, I'm from the streetwear world where for the most part, um, streetwear brands for their lookbooks and their product shots, they usually just use their friends, right? And their friends usually kind of, you know, they're from all over the world, right? They cover, it's like the United Colors of Benetton, most streetwear brands, right? Um, and it only makes sense, right? Because, you know, by and large, kids that are into streetwear don't really come from one place, right? They come from all over the place. So it I've never, ever not seen um different colors different races different heights different genders on runway shows on collection so when a company when a company that Vitamo started that obviously had a lot of street wear influenced um um positionings or products and stuff and the way they approach things and the customers are buying them were from a wholly wide swath of socioeconomic platform it only made sense to kind of include them and when they didn't they kind of you know let the sour taste in them up but Vitamo did good and they kind of corrected course they included people on the runway everything was kind of forgiven so I think in this case, Gucci need to be afforded the same kind of um, room to grow and to apologize for and to kind of move forward and to learn from. And hopefully this is a learning experience. Hopefully we do see more of an active representation inside the design studio, inside all these things. Because, you know, there are people out there that would want to work for Gucci, probably might not have the connections or might not have the in to go in there. But they, they need to be given a platform to kind of go in. And hopefully we see that going forward. Um, again, I'd, I'd say Alessandro isn't a racer. I wouldn't say he's a bigot in any kind of way. I just think it's one of those missteps that happens in a company when you don't you don't really have anyone in there that is culturally aware, um, which is a shock really to consider, you know, it's a big luxury fashion house, but you know, not everyone can be aware of all things. So let's give them a let's let's give them the benefit of the doubt and hope it was just a one off thing and hope that with kind of, you know, with this consultation I think that Dapper Dan's gonna have with um the Gucci CEO that's coming up in a few weeks and hopefully with some of these changes they want to enact we see some change coming up shortly with gucci but yeah that was a story that developed over the last couple of days i thought i'd talk about um next on the list um you got the golf wang spring summer 2019 lookbook which looks great as per usual um is it 2019 or 2019 or 2018 why is it oh 2018 lookbook did i talk about this before i think i might have anyway look at anyway um as per usual man um the tyler's doing the damn thing isn't he right um i don't i'm not sure we actually appreciate just how important tyler the creator is um to the old um scene overall is it we don't really appreciate how, how much of a good job he's done um in terms of how he's positioned himself on the industry um his influence um when it comes to the festivals when it comes to the things that he does with music and fashion but he's really fucking good at this fashion shit. And I really appreciate him because with the clothes that he's made, you know, he was he, he kind of went through a bit of a turbulent time with Odd Future or with the Odd Future merch and then that kind of got taken away from him, I'm assuming, or he sold it. I don't know what essentially happened there, but he was not really involved in it anymore. That kind of turned into like a brand merch thing and it kind of exists on his own little thing. It just kind of churns out the design that people wear. But then he started doing golf. And now it's sort of like evolved out of just being a standard merch brand. And it's kind of grown with his overall aesthetic too. He was always someone that kind of dressed a certain kind of way before. You know, cut off denim shorts with pulled up socks and vans. And the older he's got, he's kind of matured his wardrobe. And his brand has been an active reflection of it. And that's always something that I like to see with um, clothing brands or with individuals that have brands in the first place. I just like when brands are a direct reflection of the owner themselves or of the of the brand owner, which is why I love like Rick Owens, right? He looks like Rick Owens and um, Odd Future, or sorry, and Tyler the Creator looks like golf. Um, and it just looks great overall. Every season is getting better and better. Um, it seems like he's improving. It seems like the cut and sew is getting more sophisticated. It's taking a bit more risks. And the other thing I like about it a lot is just the colors. He's probably one of the rare um, designers out at the moment, especially for especially in the kind of hip hop scene, who's kind of strays away from doing black looks. Like there's never ever a black look. It's always loads of colors. Like even this um, 
bulletproof vest, quote unquote. It's got no violence written on it on the front, and it's like yeah, it's like a green, like a bright green uh, bulletproof vest. We don't usually see everyone usually does black, and the guy's got like a little hand scarf in his hand. Like it's always great colors. That's what I really like about um, Tyler Crate's collection. He's always kind of going for colors and and kind of giving the consumer. Um, Telling him to take a risk, telling him not to just go for the safe, the safe option. Trying to t- take a look, take some risk a little bit, like wearing like this look here with the uh, pink cable knit jumper, um, some khaki, some olive green shorts, white socks, and what they look. I forgot the brand these shoes, but um, times wearing them a few. Um, I think they're Padmore or Padmore shoes. I think they've got a collaboration coming up soon. So just taking a few more risks, like with clothing, and I really, really appreciate him, and I think it's fucking awesome. Um, and again, I think most of the stuff is available online at the moment. So if you want to check them out in the online store, you can. This tracksuit here is fucking awesome. Color block tracksuit looks fucking awesome. Looks great. I love this look with the grandma or the granddad um, cardigan that Tyler's been wearing quite often these last couple of days. And by and large, it's a great collection. And obviously, um, the down jacket in fl- in floral, which reminds me of what was that brand? There was that old LA brand that used to do loads of floral. Is to take like old couches and turn them into hoodies. Remember upholstery? I forgot their name, but yeah, it just reminds me of that. And again, like this fur coat is awesome with a little le- with a little flowers on them. Um, so yeah, once again, big up and of course Tyler's signature like Kelly green color that he's always a big fan of. Do you remember that era where Tyler only wore like green hats? Um, so yeah, that looks great. So Tyler the Creator Golf Wang or Winter 2018. There you can check out for your viewing pleasure. I thought that looked quite interesting. Um, what else is next on the list here? Bada bing, bada bing, bada boom. Kiko and Camper. Oh, these look really, really nice, actually. Um, Kiko has kind of risen, risen to prominence, or not risen to prominence. I'd say he's been doing, doing good bits here and there, right, for a long, long time. But I think one thing that he's really, really good at is collaborations, um, especially when it comes to sneakers. Um, he's, and I think maybe that's to do with is that to do with being a good designer like being actually when you're a good designer are you able to really plug into a brand um, a footwear brand and just kind of do something really nice because you know how to design stuff from scratch when someone gives you a kind of silhouette to kind of run with it's sort of like probably easy work for most designers right like I think of someone like um, Jeff Anderson he really does good sneaker collabs um, so does Kiko but he just hits them out of the park for the most part. And the stuff that he's been doing with Camper has been really interesting because um, from, you know, in the, in just a conventional sense, they're incredibly ugly, right? But they just look good for some reason. I don't know how, but they look good. They're, they're, they're at that, there's a real tension between how ugly they look and how good they look. And these shoes are, are no exception. They, they kind of remind me a little bit of the kind of shoes you'd get like in Shoe Zone, in Stratford, shopping mall. Uh, that are like five pounds, right? And that usually, usually most of the Asian kids in my in my like Indian kids in my in my school would wear with the fucking massive strap, and they look like they look like even when you put them on, they look like they're the wrong way around. But again, they look awesome. Like I'd actually wear them. That's the thing. So they look so horrible, but that I'd actually wear them. Um, so a Velcro strap was always a bit of a hard sell. I remember I had a pair of Velcro strap kicker shoes that I bought from a factory a factory outlet a long time ago that were hard to kind of you know sell my friends on them they kind of thought i look like an idiot wearing them because you know um velcro shoes have weird connotations towards them but i love them but i understand the kind of trepidations guys have with wearing velcro shoes especially when you're not you know over the age of 70 maybe you might not want to wear velcro shoes but i really like this model um it seems like he's um for this new collection he's done quite a couple of new models for camper as you can see here we've got these da, da, da. what else has he got there Got these orange ones that look fucking banging actually. I love the sew on them. Another another pair as well with some cutouts. Another black one with some cutouts too. But I think the black with the strap is probably my favorite so far out of all of them. But yeah, um Kiko um collaboration with Camper coming out very, very soon, I assume. When's it due to come out here? Should have a date. Actually, some of the press shots look quite interesting too, don't they? I'll get that on screen but they're due to come out oh these fucking pop-ups are annoying they're due to come out on the 12th so they came out when yesterday so check those out if you want to purchase camper and kiko um what else is next here on the list ba, 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 ba. oh balenciaga spring summer 2019 campaign video looks fucking cool 
very matrix or not very um essentially matrix inspired um and yeah it, it just goes to show how on the power on the pow how much you have to do nowadays to garner attention or to garner views or to kind of you know really tap into what's going on in the digital landscape at the moment if you're a brand you can't it's not just enough having a good runway show uh shooting good campaign um shots you have to, it has to be a holistic thing it has to be all encompassing and of course the last collection from blends i think which was um springs so 2019 blends collection it was very much futuristic futuristic in um influence i remember there was that amazing tunnel with all the kind of weird graphics swirling around it there was loads of um 3d printed um suitings that they did in the last couple of seasons so there was a lot of kind of steering towards that kind of dystopian futuristic um world um of course some of the glasses that they've been putting out recently have kind of lent themselves to the whole uh matrix feel but i thought this video looked really cool i'm gonna play a bit of it now so you guys can see it yourselves but it's a little matrix video um inspired video from balenciaga which you can check out um but 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 let me play it here get on screen boom <laughs> When's the last time you see someone wear rollerblades in public? It's been a long time. I don't even see people wear rollerblades anymore, man. Remember that was a big deal back in the day in my area. People rollerblading. So it's really cool. I love the shades and the shades are really awesome, man. Great suiting too. On the shoulders. You have the video shot. The shitty graphics. <laughs> Fucking awesome, isn't it? They did a really good job in this album. I think it's crazy good. You see a lot of this kind of uh, editing on stuff like uh, PewDiePie's videos, right? There is. It seems like it's come back into vogue recently. Um, kind of purposely shit uh, editing, which probably might be a reaction to people not, you know, getting fed up or having spending hours and hours doing editing properly. But yeah, I think that's amazing. Loads of great use of green screen, by the way. Genius, isn't he, mate? They know what he's doing. Oh, really cool. I'm a big fan of it. Man. Loads of great, loads of great outfits and pieces in there, especially the sunglasses. They're probably, if not sold out, going to be sold out. As soon as some famous rapper wears them, they're gonna fly out. But I love them anyway. I think they look fucking awesome. They did a little pop shop, I think, in um, Dover Street, actually for the glasses um but we are probably it is probably obvious to see that we're getting the best of them at balenciaga right i think that's something that no one can really argue with i think over the years as the years as the years have trends have kind of developed over the years or well, as as been, as time has gone as time has gone by over the years i think um, with them as responsibilities being split between vetemar and balenciaga we're seeing his best work at balenciaga of course maybe the platform the resources whatever it may be and we're seeing vetemar now be turned in more into an art project it seems like from the outside looking anyway it seems like that's where he kind of um, goes a bit crazy and does what he not crazy but he goes he kind of defies conventions right he kind of steers what he wants the collection previous to the last was kind of based on georgia and his influences the collection recently now with all the taxidermy behind it was kind of based on like dark web influences so he's kind of you know he kind of doesn't it it, it seems like he kind of doesn't spend as much time on vetima as he did in the beginning which obviously makes sense and we kind of get a more commercial polished version of his vision at balenciaga and you know the influences from of his from the industries you know it's obvious to see but i think he just does a really good job of understanding how to appeal to the art kids like me right or the people that kind of give a shit about references that are looking a bit deep into deeply into things and just the and just the kid who happens to pop by dover street market on a saturday afternoon and wants to buy like a, a fresh coat because he's got a date later on in the evening like he knows how to apply appeal to both people and i think that's that's usually the the that's a very rare talent to have how to appeal to like the kind of you know the culturally aware people and the people that just want to look fresh on a weekend it's very very hard to do 
um, and Demler does a really good job of doing it at the moment. So yeah, I recommend you check that out by and large. Uh, Blanchago again, out of all the big luxury fashion houses out at the moment, they're probably my favourite. That kind of always kind of to keep an eye on what they're doing. Um, what else happened? Du, 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 du. Oh, talk about fast fashion. Yeah, this is fucking fast. So this story is really funny. I found it on Diet Prada. So I think essentially what happened is um, Kim Kardashian posted an image on her Instagram of uh, of an outfit, of a dress that she hasn't worn in public yet. So the caption goes as follows, right? I'm going through old fitting pics and found this gold look that Kanye made for me for my Miami trip last year. I went with the neon uh, vibes instead. PS5 fashion brands, can you please wait until I wear this and roll up before you knock it off? lol so essentially she you know kanye made a distress that she didn't get a chance to she didn't get a chance to wear and as soon as she posted on the instagram page three hours later misguided had had it available like had it on their you know on their what you call it on their instagram feed and it's going to be available to buy now and that is essentially that is even that is even more than fast fashion that's like i don't know that's terrifyingly quick and uh misguided's fa- uh caption on the images the devil works hard but misguided works harder kim at kim kardashian you've only got a few days before this drops online jesus christ and it's just to say it's interesting because i think diet Prada argues whether or not this is um the new um angle of collaborations whether or not this is just a, a ploy in the beginning to kind of you know get um a, a ploy to announce the collaboration in the first place i'm not really sure i wouldn't read i wouldn't be that cynical and i think it's just you know in in general it's just you know it just happens to be that she posted it and misguided it, copied it i don't think it's necessarily a collaboration but what it does throw up a really interesting question is intellectual property right and who has the rights to things right because you see a lot happening with virgil and he gets called out a lot for stealing people's designs but he kind of goes out of his way to say he doesn't really um categorize it as stealing it's just referencing an inspiration when it comes with his essentially when you put something out on the internet um it's fair game anyone can kind of take it remix it and do it in their own way which you know is something that we can argue until the cows come home but is there something is there a is it all is it all fair in love and war when it comes to just taking something and making it your own because essentially kanye designed this this dress right it's a it's a it's a dress that was that didn't exist prior to kim kardashian posting instagram and essentially, Miss Guy have now taken that dress and decided to kind of remake it, um, you know, uh, thread by thread or image by image, and then put it out available to sell. And, you know, fast fashion brands have been doing this for ages. Essentially, fast fashion brands are only doing this because consumers want that, right? Consumers who can't necessarily afford to buy stuff on the runway um, want that look. So fast fashion steps in. And if you don't have any scruples, you don't really care about the environment, you don't care about working conditions and all that sort of malarkey and, you know... Um, um, wastage you're gonna go in there and buy your celine copy um from zara right you're gonna go and buy your like fake barman jeans from h&m wherever it may be you're gonna go buy that look because essentially you just want the look you don't care about the actual label right which is fair enough and i think that's fine but i wonder what will happen in the future if we'll get to a point where people can start copywriting shapes copywriting them too like for instance like there's nothing stopping someone from taking a supreme box logo hoodie and just writing whatever they want in the t- in the text box, and then reselling it themselves, right? Um, I-, I think even Barbara Kruger said something quite funny. I think when Supreme sued another company for using the box logo, when Supreme stole the box lo- or the reference the box logo idea originally from Barbara Kruger, so I think that was a quite interesting um development, right? The brand that takes the inspiration then sues somebody else for taking their inspiration. So I wonder what happened in the future, whether or not we get to a point where someone could actually copyright a T-shirt design, uh, which probably is not capable i assume now because if you can't copyright a dress or trademark as a particular kind of dress a particular kind of shape um what gives what stops anyone else from doing it themselves i guess maybe um you know creative integrity you know if you're an actual creative and you actually care about the work you're doing you don't want to be known as a guy or girl that copy stuff i think that's a thing um there's also something about your peer group right uh, maybe shunning you and maybe talking bad about you don't want that to happen but by and large, if you care about commerce and you care about making money, then I don't think the general public cares that much. Especially if you go out there and announce you don't have any scruples and announce you don't really have, you don't really hold 
um, the whole referencing thing as high as the moral virtues other people do. I don't think people actually be that bothered. So there is a bit of a tension there between what the customer base expects from you, what your peer group want, what your kind of, you know, people that are around you, design fellow designers, and what you want to do in terms of making money. But um, yeah, interesting position that we're in right now at the moment. Misguided, obviously, again, tapped into that market really well. They must make money hand over fist with this sort of stuff. Um, but again, it must be annoying if you're a celebrity in some way, shape or form. Because I know for me, um, there were times I remember back in the day, even when you should post on sneaker forums, there used to be a time when some people didn't like posting their shoes they were wearing because they didn't want people to copy them right you, you you find your actually yeah because actual actually being a sneakerhead back in the day right i'll take this off the screen being an actual sneakerhead back in the day meant that you were you were digging deep into the archives right you're scouring the internet scouring your thrift stores going to t um, tk max all these other places and trying to find gems that was actually what sneakerhead was about sneakerhead wasn't about buying the umpteenth limited edition shoe that jordan fucking pedals out on nike retro puts out on adidas originals puts out right because now they're, they're they're essentially playing up to sneakerheads, right? And everything, every, literally every shoe that comes out, let's say, I don't know, five, uh, nine in ten shoes that come out are limited edition by their very nature, right? They're limited edition. They put that in a press briefing. They put that in a box. L E L E L E everywhere. Um, so they're kind of playing into it, and you know, consumers of sneakers by and large are sheep. They don't really have any kind of you know. Um, there's no collective empowerment with sneakerheads as a customer base for the most part uh, there's a segment of people who just want their shoes and don't care there's certain people a segment of people who will do whatever it, it, it takes to buy it whether it's reselling or paying a certain amount of prices and there's some people that just buy something because somebody else wore it but i remember when i used to post on crooked tongues the actual point of being a sneakerhead was that you'd go out and you'd find models that no one else knew were hot and you kind of make them cool again, right? Whatever it's Asics, whatever it was High Tech, whatever it was Diodora, Mizuno, whatever it was some obscure Adidas shoe that wasn't really in vogue at the moment. You do whatever it took to kind of go out there and find really rare shoes that no one's wearing. Rare in terms of like you don't see them around, not rare as in like only 10 were made and just wear them, right? I remember I had these Puma shoes, um, these kind of basketball or like high mid high tops that were like covered in cheetah print that I got in, off, in, the, in the offspring sale. And I started wearing them, right? So I bought them, put them on ice for like a couple of months. And then I started wearing them when they were not in store anymore. And people were going freaking out. But I bought them on a sale rack for 20 pounds, right? But there was an era where people didn't want to post their shoes because they didn't want anyone to know. Um, so I don't even know why I brought this up for. Why did I bring this up for? I don't know. But anyway, being a sneaker back in the day was much more fun than it is nowadays. Um, nowadays, it's the same old shoes being retro a million times in different colorways. Um, people still are clamoring for them for some reason. I remember I, sh I showed you that clip right before of how much it would cost if you were to buy every single single Jordan retro from last year. I think it was something like $30,000 or some shit obscene. And maybe in that whole $30,000 collection, there might be two or three shoes that you would actually want to wear. Everything else was fucking garbage. So, you know, there is an oversaturation. They're fucking flooding the market with shoes. Doesn't it's not doesn't look like it's gonna end anywhere anytime soon. But again, man, I, I wish there was more I wish there was more in, in innovation. I wish there was more um creativity when it came to what sneakers actually wear. For the most part, they don't actually wear that many interesting shoes, man. They don't wear them in interesting ways. It's just the same old shit. Um, but again, you know, maybe the market calls for that. Maybe because I'm not involved, I'm not taking a stance. I'm not trying to make things different myself, so I can kind of blame myself in that regard. But either way, it's kind of sad to see where um, sneaker culture has got to nowadays. Um, you kind of thought it would kind of improve and kind of get a bit better, but it hasn't really happened in that way. But what can we do? Um, moving forward. Oh, uh, Sheck West alleged domestic abuse case. Um, not something to be laughed about, or not something that's funny. Um, probably touchy to talk about because again it's alleged we only we're, we've only got one side of the story effectively from Justine Sky who's went she went on a bit of a media tour prior to this kind of getting out in public again for the second time talking about it and she seemed quite hesitant to really mention who it was I think if you will read on forums and you go on Twitter and stuff you would have known it was Sheck West that she was alleging that supposedly was um, mentally and physically abusive to her when they were in a relationship it was a surprise to everyone that they were even were in a relationship we didn't know that we didn't see them on social together because you know most people in relationships on social in nowadays are posting about their relationships on social but we don't necessarily see that from them so it was quite shocking to hear about it for all together and shocking too not shocking but it was surprising to hear about it from justine sky too because for the most part 
she's been fairly quiet and fairly private in terms of talking about her personal life, right? She keeps stuff kind of guarded. And I think a lot of people have kind of attributed that to the reason why she hasn't necessarily been as successful as she would hope to be successful because she seems a little bit too polished. She doesn't necessarily show any vulnerabilities in the age where people are crying on social media and being overly dramatic, right? It kind of maybe calls for you letting your guard down a little bit and social media by its very nature is quite personal. It's quite... Um, you know, you have that personal relationship with your fans because you're able to talk to them directly. Um, they're able to talk to you directly. So maybe it calls for, you know, maybe lowering your guard a bit and being a bit open. I don't know whether it's true or not. But some people say that's why she's not as successful as she kind of should be give, given the talent, given her um, connections, given the label that she's on. Um, but, you know, hearing the story, it was just like, wow, man, that's some fucked up shit that happened, isn't it? So, um now it's kind of transpired it's kind of rolled on again and we have a more of more on it and allegedly um so the original story goes something like this i'm reading this of hype beast singer justin sky has accused check west of abuse she kind of directly called him out she took to twitter on monday to reveal that check west reportedly abused her in the past when they were a couple and most recently claimed that he had along with a group of men stalked her and her friends and then attacked them which was you know a story that came out over the weekend or a couple of days ago so over twitter which is kind of horrible um, you're pathetic, Sheck, and you beat women, she wrote on her first tweet. You hit your girl uh, before me and you'll do it again. In the same tweet, she states that she was on a walk with some friends and my man when the alleged incident took place. It was recently revealed that her boyfriend, Gold Link, has addressed the abuse allegation against Sheck West in a song called Justin's Interlude uh, earlier this year. Um, so, yeah, it's just an un unfortunate state of affairs, right? Um, I think by and large. And again, we've only got one side of the story. We don't exactly know what actually happened. Um, but again, it's just, you know, I don't know, man. I don't know what's going on with these kids and abusing girls. It seems quite a prevalent thing amongst like, um, young hip hop artists. Again, maybe it's because of the, you know, you get money and you get fame so early in life and that kind of heightens emotions and stuff. But I can't necessarily see myself, picture myself hitting a woman I was in a relationship with. Um, it just doesn't seem like the thing to do when you're in love with somebody, Especially considering the power that we have, the way we're able to kind of throw ourselves around, hit striking a woman just seems like the worst possible thing that you could do. Especially if you want to win an argument, it kind of immediately cancels anything right you had to say. And, you know, and generally you're hitting someone that's defenseless, really. Someone that can't really defend themselves if you get really into your rage mode. So it's not necessarily fair in that part. And just in general as well, it's just not a good image representation you want for the kids coming up, right? Who follow these people. To see that it's such a prevalent thing that it's so it's such a normal thing and um maybe it's not a normal thing maybe we hear about the stories and they get pushed out to us more and they get dramatized and I, people like me talk about them and it kind of makes them bigger than what they are i don't know but i just don't i just don't know what needs to be happening in order to kind of make sure these things don't occur anymore because we'd hate it to get serious because at the moment now they're just abuse cases right they're not um they're not they haven't they haven't crept into that kind of, you know, um, dangerous era where people are being, you know, f um, fish are being disfigured or God forbid are ending up dead and shit. Cause that can happen also. Right. You, we, we know what crimes of passions are. We're so thankful that hasn't happened yet, but we can't, we can't like be, we can't not, we can't not assume that that might happen in the future. So something needs to change. People need to take a stance. People need to kind of address these things. And you just hope that their friends, people in their circle, are kind of pulling them aside and kind of telling them how to kind of go about life and how to kind of conduct themselves in public. Because is there something to be said for the lack of A and R that these things are coming up more regularly, right? The like the, the fact that these kids are going from SoundCloud to YouTube to big record labels to money being pumped into them, and they're not being told how to conduct themselves, what is right behavior, what isn't the right behavior. They're just kind of being left to kind of handle it or fend for themselves. Maybe that's something to do with it, but you'd hope that their friends would step in and kind of get involved. And again, um, I'm hoping it's not true. Hoping it's not something that has happened because, you know, Sheck is just getting his career started. For something to just happen would ultimately would derail it. I'd assume so. I don't know how hip hop community deal with these kind of cases. It seems like if he was not, if he was, if he was white, I assume this would probably cancel him, right, immediately, just the accusation alone. Um, but maybe we're getting to a better place now where, you know, you're not just being cancelled due to an accusation. That's probably a better thing.
but also you're hoping that if it is true that some lessons are going to be learned and you know you can't just go around like hitting women that's not necessarily a thing you should or can be doing um but you know again hopefully more comes of the story hopefully we see a resolution soon and hopefully lessons are learned probably won't be learned but hey ho what can you do um thoughts go out to justin sky and her friends and it no one likes to be imagine someone get imagine getting stalked by your ex-boyfriend and their mates and then getting rushed like these guys are absolutely nuts so they'd risk it all in it and you can't as well these all these um rushing things as well they're really con- confusing because these guys are worth millions right and you know united states of america is probably the one of the places one of the one of the you know one of the places where I wouldn't want to get into a physical altercation with somebody just because they might want to sue you. People love getting sued out. They love suing everyone, right? There's that, you've seen that video of that guy in, that, in his office, on his kitchen, off, in his um, workplace kitchen, and he kind of spills some water on the floor and tries to fall over and claim some compensation. Americans are wild with that shit, man. Like, they love a good lawsuit. So the last thing I want to do is kind of be actively stalking somebody in my car and then jump out and rush them, especially someone that knows me. That's something I'd want to do because you don't know who you're hitting. They could have no, they could, they could not abide by any kind of code of the streets and just want to sue you and get money. Okay, cool. You're going to hit me? No worries. You got your temporary L. You got your stripes. I've got a busted lip. I've got a black eye. But now I'm going to take you to the bank. Do you know what I mean? They could easily do that. And it's not something that, and you know, that's not something that you want on your, on your books, is it really? So I don't really get all that stuff. I, I, I understand the need for physical altercations to kind of, you know, settle disputes, but, you know, call somebody up. You want a one-on-one, call them up. Um, square up somewhere. No cameras, but this whole jumping out of cars and rushing randoms is fucking, it's such a, you're shooting yourself in the foot. And I don't think anyone, I don't think anyone deserves a beating that's going to cost them a hundred, that's going to cost them, like, you know, a quarter of a mil. Like, even my worst enemy, I wouldn't want to beat up just for a quarter of a mil, right? I might want to slap for 10 grand, but not for a quarter of a mil. <laughs> That's a hell of a lot of money to, uh, to what you call it, to risk of uh, just hitting somebody. I wouldn't necessarily want to do that, personally, in my opinion, anyway, but maybe, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe when you do really hate somebody, you'd, kind of do, you'd risk it all just to kind of get your hands on them. But I don't know. It just seems a bit strange to me. But hey, ho, what can you do? So hopefully that story kind of resolves itself and all parties um, can get to where they need to get to. But again, just concerning to see, you know, this guy's a new artist, just come out. And now he's been accused of some heinous crime by a person that doesn't necessarily seem that she would need to lie about anything. And it's just weird because it seems like she... Um, I, th- I wonder what's kind of brought this on because from the interviews, it seemed like Justin Sky was really going out of her way not to say anything. I think she kind of knows the weight of her power, uh, the weight of her words or the power of her words. And she knows how... She knows what she's saying what the effect that it could have on his career she's aware of it she's very cognitive of it which is you know it goes to show the character of the girl um so she was really trying to go out of a way to say look don't mess with me don't fuck around with me i don't want to fuck over your career you're just getting started leave me the fuck alone right but just know that i know and just know that they know the public she was kind of saying it like in between nines and all of a sudden she kind of now just snapped and she's like no fuck this and she's kind of come out and say it. maybe it's because you know allegedly this whole uh, rushing thing happened but you know, credit to her, man. Credit to her, to be honest, because I think other women in her position would just would just be want to be vindictive and kind of get them get the person back straight away. But she's very aware of how uh, she's very aware that this could really derail his career and it could fuck him over for life. And it might, you know, you know, he could he could be changed. He could be a changed person now. You don't know, so you don't want to necessarily do that. You don't necessarily take any enjoyment of ending someone's career, or maybe you do if you're, you know, really on that kind of me too train. Um, but yeah, I'm hoping it gets sorted out. I'm hoping they get resolve it and everyone can kind of move on. And again, hoping lessons can be learned from it um, with this younger generation, not to kind of hit women, man. That's not really a cool thing to do, by and large. Not, it, doesn't need, it doesn't need to be said, but you know, I'll say it anyway. Um, next on the list, oh, it's good. Uh, support Coolidge. Go and support Coolidge. I saw this story a while ago and it really kind of broke my heart. Um, super sad to hear. It's on Crack Magazine. I saw the story pop up. But Kula G, a, a DJ that I've seen perform a few times in London, uh, kind of, you know, a UK London staple for the most part. She's launched a GoFundMe page um, after she lost uh, most of her possessions in a self-storage fire. The story is super heartbreaking when you read it. Um, it says the following. Um, on fe- on December, on the fe- on the 31st of December, a fire broke out at London's uh, Shoreguard self-storage warehouse. The building containing 1,198... 100, 1, 
uh, rented units was completely destroyed. Hyperdub signee and Night Slug affiliate Cooley G, real name, da, 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 was one of the individuals impacted by the blaze. After her previous home was destroyed in a flood, she was in the process of property searching. Consequently, she had stored all her possessions, including studio equipment, hard drives, and vinyl collections, as well as furniture and clothes for both her and her children with the Shogard. Thus far, Shogard has not revealed whether they will be providing any compensation in um, in advance of the incident. Camp Campbell was in her were was missold insurance, meaning that she will not receive any sufficient reimbursement for the extent of the damage to her belongings. On February the sixth, GoFundMe campaign was created to raise money and for the musician who has experienced considerable emotional distress for and her two children. So yeah, so I recommend you go help her out. The GoFundMe page, I'll link it in the show notes. Um, it's there on the link. Um, help help out um, Coolie G, man. She's a fucking awesome DJ. Um, by and large, everyone I've kind of spoke to has spoken to her. Has always said she's a good person. She's kind of just had the fucking worst luck ever, man. Imagine getting your house getting flooded is one thing. Then you kind of move all your possessions to a fucking self-storage unit, which isn't cheap. They're, they're never cheap to use. I remember when I was moving out the first time, I realized how expensive that, that they are and how much of a lucrative business it is for the people that own them. And then you put it into a self-storage unit and that ends up burning. It's just like, oh, absolutely frustrating. So yeah, go support Kuni G and get her back up on her feet. I'm sure she's going through a tough time at the moment now and everyone kind of needs a bit of support in that regard. And, you know, you get missed old insurance uh, you're in a you're in a you're in a hunt to hunt. Your your property searching. Your money's tied up in deposits and stuff. She probably doesn't. You know what I mean? It, it, it's easy to see how quickly money can run out in that kind of space and time. And you know, um, let's help out our creatives and it would, that have contributed a lot to culture. Do you know what I mean people that have kind of contributed due to having an amazing night out that probably were a soundtrack to your youth? It's always good to kind of you know be there to support them when they need it to. It's rare that they come out and reach out to us, but when they do. Um, go out and support. So, like I said, go out and support. Go, um, go out and support. Um, Coolie G. I'll put the link of uh, the of the GoFundMe in the show description so you can go and donate. Um, to get her back on her feet. Ba -ba 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 -bum. What else is on here? Um, now Rogers creates the festival. Jazz Fest, Jazz Cafe have a festival. Love Box and Lance now up. It's festival season. Festivals, 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 festivals everywhere. Everyone's fucking doing a festival. Um, so yeah, now Rogers from Sheik has got his own festival, which is fucking nuts. They're not so much as these festivals are weird because they're not as much festival sometimes, but sometimes just like an exp a, a concert outside, right? So some some of them are not really festivals concert, but now Rogers seems like he's had his own festival here. It's uh, featured on uh, uh, Resident Advisor. He's got his own festival. South Bank Center. He's gonna book an eight day festival taking over the South Bank Center from the eighth of August, um, from the third of August to the eleventh. Number one, so one person's got a festival, and then we have Jazz Cafe launching a festival, which sounds really interesting. I think for me personally, um, da, 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 da. so Jazz Cafe have launched a festival in East London. Um, Jazz Cafe launched a new festival in East London. Maiden Voyage, which looks fucking awesome, right? Jazz Cafe is always a good little interesting spot. They do good little gigs there, interesting bookings. Um, and the, the articles is the following from Resident Advisor. A new festival called Mad Maiden Voyage from the team behind Jazz Cafe will take place at East London August 25th. Um, Maiden Voyage will run throughout the day at Three Mills Islands. Focus on jazz, hip-hop, Afrobeat, and funk. According to the press release, there will be just one stage with no frills, all condensed into one small, easy to navigate space. The text, which is quite interesting, right? That's that's a real, real throwback, right? That's to be how that used to be how um that's usually what councils do. I remember when UM Council has used to do a summer party. That's consensual, like what it is, like a summer fate, right? You just have one stage. And the actions come on one after the other on the stage itself. You have little intermissions in between, but that's it. That's like that's like a, a old school approach of a festival. Among the artists booked for the debut Maiden Voyage are Bradley Zero, Giles Peterson, of course, uh, Charlotte De Santos, awesome tapes from Africa, Nabili Buck, Nabili Buck, sorry, Roy Ayers and Madlib. So it seems like a really good lineup. Very eclectic, um, far reaching, very similar to the kind of programming they have at um, Jazz Cafe itself. I'm looking forward to going uh, one day, one stage, 12 to 12 p.m. to 10 p.m. on the Free Islands in E3, which is fucking awesome as well. It's a nice little space. I think that's where they did a few, what festival? They did a festival there before, didn't they, on, the, on Free Islands. got what it's called, but it's a really nice space. Bit of a bitch to get to in terms of a DLR um, connections and stuff, but with it ending at 10 p.m., I think everyone should be fine in that regard, or you can just always cycle there. But yeah, it seems like everyone is doing a festival now. I guess there's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, you're leaving a lot of money on the table. If you're a jazz cafe, right, you're, you know, 
the extra little bit of money you're earning from having a festival or from tickets and all that sort of stuff, it just makes sense to kind of do it anyway, right? And again, it, it might be a better way to kind of fit people into your programming who can't necessarily get into the Jazz Cafe. It might be a better option to kind of get them onto the festival uh, platform. But again, it's just great to see these festivals popping up year in, year out, right? It just keeps it going from strength to strength. They're not stopping with the festival. People are always kind of putting on new nights, new festivals, new festivals, new festivals. And for us, the end consumer, it's brilliant because the more competition we have, the better their price, the more compet- the more competitive their price. And we end up getting these tickets for these amazing things that are, you know, you get to see these amazing artists over a whole period of time that are fucking awesome. So I really recommend you check that out. Maiden Voyage Festival coming to you direct from the Jazz Cafe crew. Um, what's next here? Puppy, puppy, bah. Oh, Virgil's selling water now, right? So Virgil's water bottle came out with Evian. I think it got announced a few weeks ago that he was um, going to be the creative director for sustainability or something like that, right? Was that the role that he had? Uh, creative, direct, creative advisor for sustainable innovation design. Um, and the water bottle has finally come out. Um, it looks okay, I would say, right? I'm not that so. I'm not that um, hype on it for the most part. Um, I have my things with people that will drink refillable from refillable water bottles anyway. If you work in an office, you know that person that's always fucking filling up their little flask of water and walking around, you know, gargling, guzzling um, liter after liter of water in the hopes of trying to balance out their unhealthy diet and their unhealthy lifestyle. So it always kind of runs me out the wrong way. Like you know, drinking water isn't gonna make you skinny. Isn't gonna make you fit, right? You working out and not eating fucking. Um, a six pack of timeouts will probably do that but hey ho what do i know um but the refillable water design is a collaboration with a brand called soma or something like that right i don't know who the fuck soma is um it's, it's a freeway collaboration it's not even an evian what refillable water bottle it's a freeway collaboration between a virgil soma and evian um and it's got the rainbow inside on it on the outside and in these quintessential quotes and it kind of looks a bit so-so right it's not it it doesn't look like there's any effort really put into it i don't really get the point of it um virgil isn't necessarily somebody that that i would ascribe um health and wellness to for the most part apart from the the fact that he always posts pictures of his drinking green juice and stuff for the most part he's always you know it's his own prerogative but he is kind of he does he does promote an unhealthy lifestyle right in terms of like not sleeping and working all around the clock which is something that he's able to do to really great success uh, as is obvious but for the most part he doesn't necessarily strike me as somebody that you know is overly concerned with health but maybe i don't know him that well so it's a bit odd that connection in that regard um but i guess in terms of just pure design positioning element it makes complete sense right if you're ever and you want to tap into that youth market you want to sell water to millennial kids you want to get them aware get them caring about it maybe tapping into the hottest designer on the scene right now and getting him to kind of correctly direct it might be a good way but it needs something more to it and we just can't we can't just have this i think there's going to be more we're going to definitely see more from the whole project but i don't think it's just enough to get the product we just need more of a story we need some we need some narrative to go with it we need some materials we need some we need like a we need um we need a website a dedicated site we need a dedicated instagram page uh, that promotes health and wellness that maybe talks about some things concerning the environment or why they decided to use these refillable water bottles from soma um why it's a limited edition refillable water bottle which fucking makes me laugh no and maybe it's just me the notion that there's a reef limited edition refillable water bottle is just fucking just the one of the greatest finesses ever known to man right it's like the person that kind of bottled up water right um because i think there's laws in certain states in america where you can't actually turn rainwater into drinking water um which kind of again was another strong finesse right to make sure you definitely are you definitely can't just drink water from the tap you have to go and buy it from the store um but that's a great finesse right limited edition refillable water bottle it's fucking crazy and it's definitely going to sell out it's already i think the, the retailers are going to be all the main kind of um fashion stores that he kind of sells that right yeah matches yeah it'll be available exclusively on matches.com which again, you know, it's kind of funny in itself, right? Um, buying a water for a refillable water, the, the, a refillable water bottle for matches, is kind of a peak hype beast territory in that regard. But yeah, um, it looks so so. I'm not that sold on it. I don't really care. Um, I wouldn't want it. Um, it's not. It doesn't really resonate with me. I don't necessarily think Virgil's a good fit for a ref- for promoting, you know, being hydrated and all that sort of malarkey. I don't know. I think it might have made more sense to him do the whole green juice thing which I think he might have done already, right? Because um, he's always drinking those things. Um, but again, maybe the kids will like it. Maybe the kids will care. 
I don't know. Let's see what happens. But I guess for him, it's just a great way to probably, you know, add more to his repertoire, more to his CV, get some more money in the bank and use that as a platform to kind of, you know, show his skills in product design and all that sort of malarkey. Um, I'm sure that's kind of where he's kind of positioned himself, you know, in that regard. But yeah, um, I don't know. What, what, what can you say, man? It's just the water bottle, isn't it, really? Um, next on the list here... Hector Bellerin YouTube channel. Yeah, this is interesting, right? So Hector Bellerin has been uh, a footballer who has been much derided, right? I think a lot of people have a lot of things to say about him, especially within the traditional football um, supporters world, because he really, he really kind of challenges the conventions. He really, ch- he really challenges what you think of. He really kind of makes you think, question what it is to be a modern day footballer right now. Because he's all about the social media. He's all about health and wellness. He's all about alternative living. Um, he's very self-aware. Um, he talks really well. Um, it's just strange, right? It's just a strange conundrum a football fan has to go through. Because football fans, by and large, don't like seeing their football players enjoy themselves outside of football. Especially when their teams are losing. There's just something weird in grinding football players where football fans, they don't like to see their football players out to dinner, having a drink, hanging out. They don't want to see that. They just think they just live for football and train all the time, all around the clock, and just all they want to do is die and breathe for their club. Football fans don't even like it when a player just plays for their club just because it's a job. They want to believe all their players that play for their club play for their club because they love the badge, which is which is never true. But hey, so Hector Bellerin's doing this interesting thing lately with his because he's, he's injured at the moment now for quite a while, but he's been posting loads of updates on his um Twitter account. I'm, I'm assuming Instagram, but I don't follow him on there. And he's been taking whoever's been around him is taking um 35 millimeter uh, film pictures of his recovery process, right? Of him going going through rehab. I think he's a broken leg. I don't know what it is. But it's interesting because he's turned his injury into a bit of content. He's made that into a content drive. Like he's made that into a content generation platform where he's been able to kind of share his journey with his with people that kind of love him or adore him or people that don't like him. But again, it's just a different way of doing things nowadays for a footballer. It's kind of something that you kind of have maybe have to do to keep your name around, to keep to keep your keep the buzz up of what you're doing. Um Again, I, I don't necessarily, I'm a fan of it. I don't necessarily care for it. But it's just interesting what he's kind of doing by and large. And now he's kind of gone a full step further and he's doing his own vlog. And he's on YouTube now at the moment. Um, I'll play a little bit of it. Uh, I've got it here on the screen. Saturday, 19th of January. It's around 11 o'clock now. Um, i just been stretched off from from the game against against Chelsea um, I feel something in my left anyway he just continues talking it's a vlog that he's always, doing now at the moment uh, and it's just interesting right uh, just to see like what footballers are going to do going forward whether it's something we're going to see more often from footballers whether or not we're going to see footballers become a bit more private because it unfortunately for footballers when they do go super social and something goes wrong or they lose a game or they have a bad performance, the first thing fans go to, the first thing they're, they're, they're kind of people, critics that don't like them go to is the activity on social media. You see a lot with Benjamin Medi. He's somebody that's really on social, heavy on the whole, you know, he Instagram stories all the time. He's always around. And you see how, but he performs really well when he is playing. He's injured now for a while, but when he's playing, he's really good. But as soon as he kind of has a bad performance, the first thing they point towards is, over, is, is kind of, is, in their quotes, overuse of social media. But it seems like sports or athletes now, especially footballers, are becoming a bit more aware. And I think they're probably becoming a little bit more jealous as well of their US counterparts. Because in America, it seems like most athletes, most professional athletes can get away with just being on social media, you know, broadcasting live or whatever it may be. It's not it's not looked down upon in the same way. I don't know why. Um, um, so I guess if you're a young kid coming up now, you kind of see the likes of LeBron James, Russell Westbrook being so active on social, you kind of want to do the same thing too. So they're kind of changing tact and kind of going for it. And I'm, and I'm a big fan of it personally. Um, I don't really care for the whole injury update thing on with the film on it. I, I, that's that's one thing. But again, I think it's good for the Hector Bellerin brand. It kind of keeps him, he's got his name kind of out there for the most part, even though he you know his role or even though his job doesn't really call for him being always around in front camera because you know in the end of the day he plays football so as soon as he's not injured he'll play it's not about that but it's just a good positioning for him for when he does eventually hang up his boots or he does talk full time his career he's got a lane that he can go into straight away right he's built this kind of following on social that he can kind of immediately kind of get involved in and again i'm a big fan of it man i think it's cool to see and we might probably see him more of it in the future coming up soon you never know you never bloody know anyway 
that is an hour already the Axiom Zinger show thanks so much for tuning in I'll leave you guys from there I'll leave you guys there sorry from there from there from there English please anyway <laughs> thanks so much for tuning in it's been an actual pleasure to have the company your company today this morning um if you're doing anything this week i guess take care it's only wednesday anyway so you're probably not doing anything for the most part but if you are take care of yourself and those around you and i'll we'll see you back again on the excellent Zinger show episode number 1000 whatever very very soon peace